Okay. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you are um, here with us at the Socialist Equality Parties Town Hall meeting um, to really lay out and introduce the platform of David Moore, our candidate for governor here in California. My name is Narisa Santa Cruz. I am the SEP's uh, vice presidential candidate last year for the 2020 elections. Uh, I ran on a ticket with Joseph uh, Kishore uh, for the SEP and uh, really want to welcome everyone who's joining us from California, uh, throughout the U.S. and also uh, to many of our international uh, viewers and supporters. We are running an international campaign um, and David uh, will speak more to this. Um, so before we kind of jump in and um, I introduce David, I'd like to let everybody know about how the uh, format of today's meeting is going to go. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation uh, from our candidate. Uh, and during this time, we uh, encourage you to type in questions uh, into the chat box because following this presentation, uh, we're gonna go ahead and um, uh, take questions from the audience uh, and you know, David will answer them and I'll facilitate with moderating uh, that discussion. So, uh, let's go ahead and jump in, and without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to now introduce our candidate, David Moore. Uh, David Moore is the California gubernatorial candidate with the Socialist Equality Party. David is a special education teacher from Oakland, California, and as a member of the SEP, uh, and uh, as a writer for the World Socialist website, he's written directly um, on and participated in the struggles and strikes of educators, uh, teachers throughout the country, um, as well as transportation workers, BART workers in Northern California, nurses and oil refinery workers. David previously ran as the SEP candidate for Senate in California in 2018. Um, and David is calling for an international strategy for the eradication uh, of COVID-19. Uh, we are advancing a socialist perspective to tackle uh, not just the global pandemic, uh, but also social inequality climate change, uh, war, uh, and really all of the ills of the capitalist system. Um, so uh, David, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Thank you for that introduction, Marisa. So I'll hop right into it because there is an immense amount to cover. Um, but let me bring up my slides for the moment. Now, the recall election in California is taking place amidst a resurgence of the pandemic uh, that's really demonstrates quite forcefully that neither the Democrats nor the Republicans had any plans on how to actually end the pandemic, how to uh, eliminate transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and how to really deal with the medical ramifications uh, of this. Their entire policy so far has been oriented solely towards the question of maintaining profits for corporations and making sure uh, the military maintains record funding. Uh, all of this at the intense expense of the working class in California and across the country. The U.S. is once again uh, at the epicenter of the pandemic. These are the daily new cases for the United States. You see we are in a clear surge on the right that has the strong potential, particularly as schools reopening, to overtake the surge we had in November, December, and January. Uh, and this is all the more striking because it's under circumstances where a vaccine is available. Now, 
a particularly sharp aspect of this current pandemic crisis is pediatric hospitalizations. Uh, the Delta variant that is spreading across the country and internationally is much more effective at infecting uh, children. We are seeing a large rise in uh, pediatric hospitalizations. On this graph, the yellow is children ages zero to four. The gray is children age five to 17. And it's worth really noting that uh, there is no vaccine authorized for children 12 and younger. So when Biden and Newsom and some of these other figures cynically talk about the uh, pandemic of the unvaccinated, uh, what they really mean is a pandemic of children. And you'll notice that the rate of pediatric hospitalizations has actually reached record highs that were not met in November, December, January of the last major peak. Uh, and part of that is precisely because so many schools were in distance learning at that point. Uh, we are seeing, uh, I mean, Los Angeles, one of the largest school districts in the United States, opened up on August 16th. Uh, we're seeing Chicago has opened up this past week. New York is being pushed to open up. And so although a lot of the emphasis in the news is on the horrifying scenes coming out of Florida, Texas, Georgia, much of the South, where there's a real policy of infecting people as fast as possible. Uh, what I'll show in this presentation is that the democratic states have no less, the democratic states, democratic politicians have no less decided that they are going to pursue a policy of mass infection of children with incalculable uh, 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 results. Uh, we literally do not know at this point the long-term impact of infection with COVID-19, although the early signs are deeply troubling. And I'll go into that a bit. But first, I want to look at the specifics of California. On June 15th, when uh, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, decided to throw open the state, as it were, to remove these basic public health measures that were enacted, to scrap the color-coded uh, system of counties, uh, there were 1,019 uh, daily cases. Um, since then, and I, this is something I want to emphasize, uh, Newsom has lied to the people of California, but in doing so, he's just been continuing the lies presented by Biden. On August 11th, Newsom told the public vaccinations are how we will end this pandemic. Uh, he was counting on kind of the lull of the summer to remain indefinitely, despite all scientific evidence to the contrary. But as we see by his statement on August 16th, this uh, Newsom, just like the Biden administration, was fully aware that the policies he was pursuing were going, was going to result in mass infection and mass hospitalizations. On August 16th, the uh, Public Health Department in California, uh, Gavin Newsom signed an executive order uh, at their request informing hospitals that they will have to be prepared to take emergency transfers of COVID patients. And part of the statement read uh, that the rate of increase in cases is higher than it's ever been in the pandemic so far, and that hospitalizations have increased over 700% in the past two months and are projected to continue to increase. August 16th, I do not think it is a coincidence, but August 16th is also the day that Los Angeles schools uh, opened in person uh, without a significant distance learning option. And far from now, we're facing about 16,000 daily new cases across the state. It is tough to give a precise count of this, even in terms of averages, because the state of California has consistently been delaying their release of uh, infection information to the CDC and the public. Uh, sometimes uh, the data is lagging uh, four days, uh, sometimes more, and uh, sometimes it cut, arrives uh, incomplete. Uh, and as we'll kind of see, this is, this is part of their intentional decision to downplay the seriousness of the disease and to try and prepare the public 
to quote unquote, live with COVID-19. Uh, in other words, be prepared to die with COVID-19. As you can see in these graphs, this is hospitalization in ICU beds in California, uh, going back to April 2020 on the left, uh, August and now into the very beginning of September on the right. Uh, we're seeing hospitalizations above where they were a year ago, again, the, despite the large amounts of vaccines in the state. And you might note you might notice something interesting in the ICU bed availability. Even in the lull of June here, uh, June 2021, uh, in terms of uh, hospital use, the ICU capacity did not reach the heights it had before in June 2020. There's far from building up the healthcare capacity of the state, there's been a steady decline. Now, these are all just the, some of the basic facts to help orient you to the centerpiece of the campaign. Capitalism in the United States and across the globe has failed to contain the pandemic. We are fighting to mobilize the working class to say, no, we will not die with this pandemic. We will not just say it's okay and normal to infect millions of children, but we will fight for uh, the need to eliminate the pandemic. We will fight uh, 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 to demand a safe and secure environment for children and workers across the country and across the world uh, to really eradicate this disease worldwide. But I want everyone to really think through the crisis in California is just one piece of the crisis of capitalism worldwide. And really, when you look at the United States, you cannot look at any aspect of U.S. policy, of U.S. society, and not see an intense crisis of capitalism. We see the complete unwillingness, despite the scientific knowledge, uh, despite having the scientific knowledge necessary, the complete unwillingness to actually eliminate COVID-19 transmission within the United States. But that's coupled with an enormous crisis in terms of geopolitics, the United States colonial adventures across the globe, its wars of aggression have reeled from debacle to debacle, whether the invasion of Iraq, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Libya, the uh, civil war in Syria sparked by US arms, you get the complete failure of US foreign policy to do anything except waste trillions of dollars in the destruction and sociocide of innocent people across the globe. And their real policy of maintaining geostrategic dominance through military might against everyone uh, to be in a very uh, uh, dangerous, uh, deadly state of collapse. The, according to the various pseudo left groups, the election of Biden was going to bring in a, a brand new space for the left to operate where all of a sudden the horrors of the Trump administration would become a thing of a path, the past. New left wing forces would come to the fore and the right wing would be in retreat according to them. And instead what we see is an assault all down the line by far right forces in terms of voting rights, in terms of abortion rights, and a complete agreement or a complete refusal to fight on these points from the Democratic Party, which simply has the presidency, the Senate, and the legislature under its control. Uh, and the heart of it is we'll keep going back to again and again, is that the Democrats and Republicans both represent the capitalist class. They are hostile to the interests of the working class. In the words of Joe Biden, uh, we need a strong Republican party and the Democrats far prefer these uh, uh, neo-fascist organizations uh, to whip up far right anti-vaccine, anti-abortion sentiment uh, to any movement of the working class to demand their basic democratic and social rights. Beyond the political crisis, we see a whole series of natural disasters that simply emphasize the basic point with the pandemic. 
16 years after Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ida has devastated southern Louisiana. Nine years after Hurricane Sandy uh, flooded New York, we have the remnants of Hurricane Ida flooding New York City, uh, New Jersey, uh, strand killing dozens, stranding uh, uh, millions. Um, in a real shocking scenes of devastation. Within California, we see three years after the destruction of Paradise and the Camp Fire, the destruction of Greenville in the Calder Fire. And there's a, there's a common theme to these. Obviously, there is the crisis of the climate change, which is intensifying the wildfires, intensifying the storms. But we also see completely predictable natural events being allowed to kill dozens, hundreds, uh, and ultimately when you look worldwide, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people. Uh, these completely predictable events are not being contained, are not being controlled after year, year after year of increasingly intense wildfires in California has not resulted in a modern firefighting system, has not resulted in the modernization of the electrical grids, which continue, uh, PG&E's equipment continues to spark deadly wildfires again and again and again. And yet, instead of uh, uh, taking control of this, the state under Newsom has simply bailed PG&E out and we have yet again of an incredibly destructive wildfire season. Uh, one can go into a lot more detail on any one of these crises, but the important thing I'd really say to note is no one, not the Democrats, not the Republicans, neither of these two big business parties has any plans to actually prevent these disasters from destroying large sections of society. I remember quite distinctly uh, during the campfire when Governor Brown uh, uh, suggested that what they needed was for individual families to buy personal fire bunkers, uh, that that was the solution to this. They weren't going to solve the, they weren't going to maintain the forests, they weren't going to maintain the electrical infrastructure, uh, but the solution is to just get personal bunkers, which is a ridiculously dangerous and unscientific idea given the way fires burn oxygen out of the air. Um, but you get these kind of ridiculous uh, 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 conceptions that come out because both big business parties are oriented 100% to the economic interests of the major corporations, the defense of the billionaires, and no solution is possible with the amount of intense and growing inequality we have experienced. So that nationwide crisis, that broader crisis of capitalism, is part of what's really driving uh, the almost cartoonish character of the California recall election. It is quite striking, given the seriousness of the issues confronting California, that as far as I can tell, no candidate other than myself is actually calling for the elimination of COVID-19. Uh, you have here the leading Republican candidate on the left, Larry Elder, ideological mentor to Trump's uh, fascist advisor, Stephen Miller. On the right, you have the leading Democratic candidate, landlord and YouTube influencer, uh, Kevin Paffrath. And if you just go through some of their positions, it, it verges on the absurd, yet these are the figures that are being coughed up, uh, one could say the scum that is rising to the top in terms of the crisis, political crisis within the United States and California. Uh, Larry Elder very notoriously uh, is calling for a zero dollar minimum wage, scrapping the minimum wage. In terms of the uh, pandemic itself, his website says the virus and its variants should not lead to panic or overreaction. It is long overdue for California to return to normalcy. And this is under circumstances where the current prediction is that 100,000 Americans will die before the end of the year from COVID-19. Uh, Kevin Paffrath, for his part, 
says on his website, lockdowns will not be necessary to contain COVID. We can win through herd immunity, logical masking, and vaccination. Again, the current prediction is 100,000 people will die before the end of the year, roughly 10,000 of those in California. And the attitude of the two main uh, recall candidates promoted by the media is that the problem with Gavin Newsom is that he's done too much and not that he's done too little. Uh, this isn't even touching on some of the more insane proposals of Pathrath, such as using the National Guard to round up all homeless people within the state and building a pipeline from the Mississippi to solve California's drought problems. It's a combination of idiocy and childishness. But if we go beyond the local figures, what has the, in, what has the position been of the pseudo left more broadly in terms of the campaign, this uh, recall election? Bernie Sanders has weighed in in favor of Gavin Newsom, as have the Democratic Socialists of America. The DSA Los Angeles branch has claimed that the path to Medicare for all flows through California. They need Newsom to beg uh, President Biden for waivers so that uh, California can implement its uh, own single payer health care system. That's the extent of their goals. And so they're calling for a no vote in the recall election without endorsing any candidate. Very same position by Bernie Sanders, uh, who is now chair of the Senate Budget Committee, a very establishment Democrat to this point. And you see a very similar situation with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, in New York, handing out backpacks to school children, trying to pump them up for the return to in-person instruction. None of them are presenting any actual position to protect workers from the dangers of the pandemic. None of them are presenting any actual fight for socialism. And the thrust of this is they're leaving the mass opposition that exists to the Newsom administration, to the crimes of the Newsom administration with regards to PG&E, with regards to the pandemic. They're leaving that for the far right. And essentially the, the stance is any opposition to Newsom must flow through these very far right figures. Uh, and it ultimately it promotes them. The Socialist Equality Party is running me as their candidate in this election precisely to provide a left-wing alternative. Recognizing the far right character of the recall election, we call for a no vote on the recall. They, but we recognize that the only reason these right-wing, pro-Trump, anti-vaccine, anti-public uh, health measure forces were able to get millions of signatures for the recall is because there was widespread anger and disagreement over Newsom's policies, which placed the entire burden of the pandemic on the working class, uh, which allowed major companies like Tesla to operate without and just ignore public health orders. Uh, all the while, Newsom praising Elon Musk as the CEO of Tesla for all his innovation. Uh, well, hundreds of workers get sick in his factories. And he thumbs his nose at the public health officials. And I think on a very fundamental level, none of these figures are presenting an alternative to the homicidal policy of school reopenings, which is really one of the sharpest expressions of the bankruptcy of the Democrats and Republicans across the country. It is unsafe to have in-person instruction while there is rampant community spread. And I'll go into some of the details in just a moment. But this amounts to a deeply unethical medical experiment where millions of children are going to be infected with COVID-19 unless we stop it. And so we are fighting to mobilize workers independently of the Democrats, independently of the Republicans, independently of the trade unions like the American Federation of Teachers uh, that is, have joined the Democrats wholeheartedly in pushing for in-person instruction in the midst of this new wave of the pandemic. 
And what have the results been? This is from the first week of Los Angeles schools. Uh, sadly, they, when we talk about their uh, lack of information, uh, they don't present a lot of the, this data in easily digestible uh, uh, formats very frequently. So I have some of the numbers for week two, but what we see here is that in the first week of school in Los Angeles, 3,186 total new cases in the K through 12 system, that's students and staff. When you add in week two, the total quite naturally doubles to about 6,000. And I think you should also really look at these number, uh, this number of breakthrough cases, the percentage of these cases that were fully vaccinated, uh, because it, it's significant. Uh, Again, to emphasize, children under 12 are not vaccinated at all. But even among the vaccinated, we see that the Delta variant is able to transmit very effectively. I want to direct your attention to this case study that uh, the CDC did coming out of Marin County in Northern California. At an elementary school, one member of the staff was sick with the Delta variant and he worked for two days. During those two days, he was briefly unmasked while reading aloud to a class of 24. After those two days, half of the class was infected with the Delta variant. Now, the harsh reality is that the role played in this case study by the one staff member could have easily been played by any of those 24 students. You have the students who are certainly unmasked part of the time during lunch breaks, who certainly have trouble uh, wearing their masks consistently and safely. Uh, keep in mind, this is elementary school. You're going down very young in terms of it. And this farce of a safe reopening is playing out in district after district and school after school. And to give you an idea of why I'm emphasizing that vaccines alone cannot contain the pandemic, this is the vaccination data for Marin County, which is one of the most vaccinated counties in the entire country. And in, you, might, you might notice that very high vaccination rate for the 12 to 17 age group. So, uh, I, I mean, I can add on even more of the safety measures that were taken at this elementary school. They had two air purifiers in the classroom, and yet you see mass infections and mass outbreaks occurring from this. Um, as more and more schools across the country reopen, we anticipate more and more children getting infected, more and more of them uh, being hospitalized, and this is part of the very deep crisis around the pandemic that's driving a lot of the political instability uh, in this country and internationally. Now, the next couple points I'm going to make are going to be a little more scientifically oriented on the science of the pandemic. And if you attended uh, the rank and file committee meeting of educators, this might be a little bit of repetition. I'm going to keep emphasizing it pretty much every time I speak because there's so much information about misinformation about the reality of this pandemic that's being pushed. One of the big lies is that because children don't die at as high a rate as older people, it's safe for them to get infected or it's uh, very unlikely that there will be any serious consequences. So I want to go through some of the impacts that COVID-19 has uh, outside of simply death. A study coming out of Britain demonstrated that there were significant cognitive declines in people who had been affected by COVID-19. Uh, one moment. Uh, so this should be somewhat self-explanatory. Uh, the more severe the symptoms, the sharper the decrease in cognitive ability, 
hospitalized and on the ventilator, you're getting down to nearly uh, half a standard deviation in, uh, in terms of, uh, I don't, as a special education teacher, I really don't like using the term IQ, but I would say general cognitive ability, uh, hospitalized with no ventilator, uh, a smaller but still significant cognitive decline, and respiratory symptoms with medical home assistance, uh, significant uh, decline. Uh, but ultimately, even if you just have respiratory symptoms, as in you're not hospitalized, you aren't, a nurse doesn't come visit you in your home, you aren't given special instructions, but you have uh, it, any of those respiratory symptoms, you're, the average cognitive decline was comparable to lead poisoning. And so then if you start talking about infecting millions and millions of children across California and across the United States, what you're talking about is rolling the dice with unknown but potentially severe long-term mental impacts. Um, this is deeply horrifying as a teacher, uh, but I think it's deeply horrifying to very much any member of the working class uh, that they are declaring they want your children to take these risks. This chart marches, uh, matches in purple total deaths uh, from COVID to blue, the total number of children who've lost a parent or primary caregiver. As you probably know, the poorer a child is, the more working class their family, the more likely it is that one of their primary caregivers is a grandparent, which is of course, uh, mm -hmm. the older you are, the more susceptible you are to dying from COVID-19. And this trend has been pretty consistent uh, throughout 2020. I'd be very interested in seeing the figures continuing on to today. But there's a lot of misinformation going around. Well, uh, isn't, isn't losing out in terms of in-person instruction? Isn't distance learning causing long-term social impacts on children? Don't we need to worry about those? Isn't it causing mental health difficulties? And the short answer is some families distinctly have difficulties with distance learning, but we know very well for a fact that losing a parent has an immense impact on a child's life. Losing a primary caregiver has an immense impact. And so our duty isn't to look at the hardships that sometimes accompany distance learning and say, well, it's time to throw everything open and get everyone infected. But it's to look at those hardships and say, it is the duty of society to guarantee everyone a safe and effective public education. The final chart I wanna look at, uh, they're comparing infection with COVID versus infection with the flu on the top, and infection with COVID versus uh, just any other respiratory tract infection on the bottom in relation to the onset of psychiatric illness, mood disorders, or anxiety disorders. Uh, and, and basically, there's a longitudinal study. They mark, they do follow-up checkups after a diagnosis, after an infection, and the question is, have these symptoms had an onset in that time? And you can see the COVID infection with COVID-19 compared to influenza looks to be about doubling the onset of uh, these mental uh, uh, disorders, the psychiatric illness, the mood disorders, the anxiety disorders. So there's an immense impact of COVID-19 on people even when they don't die from it, even if they're not hospitalized from it. And it's a completely callous viewpoint being put forward that says, uh, well, let them all get infected. And then what is it? I believe the governor of Mississippi let God sort them out. Uh, that their faith in an afterlife means they aren't too worried about getting sick and dying of COVID. That is a perspective of complete bankruptcy and is ultimately shared equally by the Democrats and Republicans.
Now I want to go into the heart of, uh, uh, we had a very uh, moving meeting, uh, I believe two Sundays ago, uh, where the Socialist Equality Party and the World Socialist website brought into a panel discussion several leading epidemiologists, scientists, doctors to discuss the significance of the COVID-19 epidemic and the necessity of eliminating transmission, ultimately of eradicating the disease across the globe. Now, this is a viewpoint that's ultimately kept out of all the major media reports, all the major political discussions. The stance, certainly, of the Wall Street Journal is this is pie-in-the-sky uh, nonsense. The costs are simply too great, they say, to actually contain the pandemic. And so you get the Democrats and Republicans debating between infect everyone as fast as possible in some of these states in the South and infect everyone, but let's uh, toss a couple mitigation measures like masking or encouraging vaccinations in there. But they're ultimately heading towards the exact same point the mass infection of the public as a whole and the transition of COVID-19 from a pandemic to an endemic disease that will kill and sicken people for decades or generations to come. So it's important to really oppose that with the basic scientific knowledge that elimination is not only possible, it is necessary. Any mitigation measure that is not part of a policy of elimination is doomed to failure. And we see this again and again in the states like California or like New York that claim, oh, we're going to have a little bit of mask mandate, a little bit of lockdown here and there, but we're never going to try to eliminate the disease. And so to dig into this, I've got to explain a couple of scientific concepts, uh, the beginning of which is the basic reproduction number. How many? Uh, it, new infections do you expect to arise out of every uh, current infection? So if the reproduction number is two, then one person who's sick with COVID-19 will infect two people, those two people will infect four, a couple more transmissions, and you get, you know, what is it there? Uh, <laughs> dozens of people infected. If you have a basic reproduction number of five, one person infects five people, those five people infect 25, those 25 infect 125. Now there's a lot of factors that go into and impact the actual reproduction number, uh, the amount of immunity within a population, uh, the amount of uh, opportunities, as in if one person is traveling all over the state, meeting hundreds of people, they're going to probably infect a lot more. So this, is, this number is really looking at the average over the population. And one of the speakers at our panel discussion, uh, Dr. Uh, Gosia Gasperovitz, drew up these models, which I think are very uh, significant. This is an examination of the impact of public health measures and vaccinations if we were just dealing with the original strain of the virus that had a basic reproduction number of roughly three. So if you had a very effective vaccine program that had 70% of the population vaxxed with 99% vaccine efficiency, that would take that reproduction number of three and bring it down to an effective reproduction number of 0.92 it would not sustain itself the, the, and the infection would slowly die out because each person sick with the original strain of COVID-19 would infect fewer than one uh, other person on average. Public health measures, and in her model she used the spring 2020 shutdown in Alberta as an example, were actually far more effective than the vaccine. And with public health measures you get a reproduction number of 0.7. The best, obviously, would be a combination of public health measures and vaccines where you get a, a reproduction, effective reproduction number of 0.2, where you'd expect the transmission to die out in about 12 days. 
very effective in suppressing this. Of course, with the original strain of the, vaccine, uh, of the uh, pandemic, we did not have effective vaccines at that point. But it was still, as you can see, very possible through public health measures early on in the pandemic to eliminate transmission and from that, uh, uh, really uh, buy time to develop contact tracing, to develop quarantine measures, to develop vaccines. The death toll of this pandemic could have been counted worldwide in the thousands. Now, current best estimates of the number dead worldwide are about 15 million. And that was a conscious decision on the part of the US government, as well as the governments of Europe, as well as uh, governments across uh, South America and much of the world. But if we go with uh, Dr. Gasperwitz's uh, models onto this next one, okay, we've got the Delta variant. It's about twice as infectious as the original strain. It's got the basic reproduction number of six. And what we already see with that is even with an incredibly effective vaccine, even with uh, effective public health measures, neither of them by themselves can contain the Delta variant. You still get exponential growth. Each person infected is infecting more than one person on average. So you're expecting large outbreaks and really epidemics uh, to emerge. But the combination of vaccines can still bring it down and bring it down relatively quickly uh, from 100 daily new cases to zero in 22 days. But of course, Real life vaccines are not quite as effective as these. And one of the tragedies is that the SARS-CoV-2 has been allowed to evolve into uh, such deadly and virulent new strains as this Delta variant, uh, that the vaccine efficiency is actually dropping off. This is combined with a few other factors I won't get into quite he uh, here. But if we're looking at a more realistic vaccine, you know, 64% of the total population vax at 60% efficiency it barely makes a dent. That does not really contain the pandemic. Uh, public health measures only are doing better in that circumstance. Uh, but the combination of public health measures and vaccine can still eliminate this. Moreover, if we have sharper public health measures and have more public health measures, we can eliminate it faster, which will then allow uh, for more to uh, uh, return to a more normal uh, lifestyle as we eradicate it across the globe. But the danger is, and she pointed this out quite thoroughly in her presentation, if a new variant emerges that's far more infectious than the Delta variant, this hypothetical new variant, that's twice as infectious as the Delta, the only way to eliminate it is through increasingly harsh measures. Uh, you have to, the basic vaccines and public health measures will stop being uh, effective even then. You need to increase the severity, the length of the lockdowns uh, in order to bring it under control. You need to get vaccine boosters, you need to get uh, vaccines targeting directly the Delta variant uh, or this hypothetical new variant. And so the danger with the bipartisan decision to allow for mass infections is they're really risking that the current situation in California will become the current situation in Florida. Mass infections, mass hospitalizations, mass deaths. Uh, precisely as new variants overwhelm the incredibly limited mitigation measures that have been put in place. So the science here is basic. There's, I, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the science, but the real question then is, okay, so why if the scientific issues here are basic, if we've seen countries eliminate transmission, including China, which has eliminated transmission more than once, uh, using these basic measures that we've talked about, why has the decision of the governments in the United States and Europe and Latin America 
refused to eliminate COVID-19 transmission. And here we have Elon Musk, uh, uh, entrepreneur, uh, CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, occasionally richest man in the world, and is really kind of a case study. The conscious decision in Europe and the United States in particular has been no public health measure can impinge upon corporate profits. Here are the past five years of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You'll notice in 2020, the drop in March of 2020 with the pandemic, the meteoric rise following the passage of the CARES Act, and with the passage of the CARES Act, the decision to throw everything open uh, uh, countrywide. Obviously, the time frame of that reopening was different state by state, but the real decision was made uh, not to uh, contain the pandemic and instead shovel as much money as possible uh, to the millionaires, to the billionaires, prop up the stock markets, prop up the banks, uh, nothing really to the public. And here comes one of the graphs that's perhaps one of the most aggravating for me to keep up to date. I've included a slide like this in several presentations. I always want to make it nice and slick with a graphic. But these billionaires, quote unquote, earn money so fast, I have to actually keep updating this. And so every time I give another public talk, I have to see, well, how much, how much higher is Elon Musk's net worth? In March 2020, uh, he had about $25 billion. Uh, as of yesterday, he had $190 billion. Some of the times I've checked this, he has, quote unquote, earned $4 billion in a single day. Zuckerberg has seen his wealth grow from $55 billion to $135 billion. Larry Elson has seen it grow from $59 billion to $117 billion. Uh, we're seeing billionaires who, as ordinary Americans, as ordinary workers across the globe, have seen their wealth collapse, have seen a growth of unemployment, are facing the threat of evictions and homelessness, are seeing the enormous uh, rise in uh, uh, hunger. Billionaires have seen their wealth skyrocket. These three figures, these three California billionaires alone, have had their total wealth increase during the course of the pandemic by $303 billion. That's a bit out of over $9,000 per person in California. And so any claim that there is no money to actually contain the pandemic, there is no money for healthcare, for education, is a complete and total lie. It is a fabrication to cover up the real benefactors of government, uh, of the US uh, government policy the real class interests represented by the Democrats and Republicans both. And I was looking back through some of the presentations I gave during the 2016 elections. This is a trend that is continuing and has been growing and continuing for quite a long time. Here you see the share of income gains after recessions and what, how, what share of those income gains go to the top 1% and what share of those income gains go to the bottom 99%. Uh, and this is, uh, I believe, in terms of the United States. You have, a, and particularly you look at that last bar, the quote unquote recovery from the 2008 recession, 2009 to 2012, uh, is 95% of the income gains went to the top 1% of the population. The bottom 99% of the population only had 5% of the income gains. I haven't seen an economic analysis for the aftermath of the recession, that very brief drop in the stock markets you saw uh, in, from March 2020, but I would expect an even larger proportion of income has gone to the top 1% or even 0.1%. Uh, the real economy in terms of ordinary people is uh, nowhere near these exalted heights of the billionaires. I mean, on this call, you can just ask yourself, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Ellison, these two billionaires had their wealth double during the course of the pandemic. 
how many people in the United States do you think have had their wealth double uh, uh, during this? It's uh, only in a, a very select few. So what is the alternative? We in the Socialist Equality Party are fighting for the working class. We're entering into this recall election not because electing me is going to change the entire world, but as a method of organizing the opposition that millions of workers across the state and country feel towards the policies of Gavin Newsom, towards the policies of the billionaires, towards the Democrats and Republicans, and developing it into a conscious fight for socialism. This past year has seen immense working class struggles. I've told this anecdote a few times, but it's always worth repeating. The initial lockdowns in March 2020 were overwhelmingly driven by wildcat strikes of workers who decided we will not go back into unsafe work conditions. As a teacher in Oakland, I was involved in organizing the wildcat strikes. And I distinctly remember on March 12th, uh, 2020, uh, all the teachers were texting back and forth, were chatting, were saying, look, if the district doesn't shut classes down on Friday, we'll shut it down on Monday. Uh, and we'll, here's our demands, here's how we'll do outreach, here's how we'll explain to parents why it's necessary for their safety of the children for us to go on a wildcat strike. And of course, the uh, union ran to the district saying, look, you've got to prevent this. And on Friday the 13th, the district held emergency meetings and decided before the end of the day, okay, schools will be shifting to distance learning. Now we see a continuing issue. The unions uh, across the country are fighting to, for a return to normal, as they say, for a return to in-person instruction, precisely so the workers uh, aren't at home taking care of their kids, that they're back in the dangerous factories, making good on these hundreds of billions of dollars promised to Musk and Zuckerberg and Ellison through the stock market speculation. But the struggle continues. Here on the top, you see Volvo workers who went on a very significant strike against the desire of the UAW, which forced them to vote on effectively the same contract four times until they got it right. Uh, I might have that wrong, maybe it was five times. But uh, essentially, these workers stood up and said, we are opposed to two-tier wages. We should get equal pay for equal work. We need a safe environment. We need to end this ridiculous uh, uh, punitive system of overtime. Uh, we need to the end. I mean, this is a company that was making, I believe, record profits. Um, and yet refusing to give their workers wages uh, raises above inflation. The World Socialist website, the Socialist Equality Party, intervened heavily in the strike of auto workers who began organizing independently of the union because the union was refusing to fight for them. And uh, not just refusing to fight for them, but actively coordinating with the company to suppress their struggle. And in the bottom right, uh, just a couple days after some of our comrades in Germany spoke to Volvo workers in Belgium. There was a wildcat strike of Belgian workers, uh, inspired by the strike of the Volvo workers in the United States. And this is going to be a recurring theme. None of the basic issues confronting the working class in California and the United States can be solved locally. Uh, whether it's the economic questions, whether it's the question of the pandemic, whether it's the threat of global warming, these are all global issues and we need to fight them on a global basis. Here, I want to draw people's attention to the statewide strikes of teachers that occurred well before the pandemic, 2018. Here we've got West Virginia at the top, and I always love this picture in the bottom right, uh, a couple of teachers from Ghana saying, we support West Virginia. And workers are increasingly inspired at a global level by struggles uh, uh, of other sections of the working class. There's a general recognition. We're all confronting the same basic issues. And what we see among teachers in the United States and internationally is far from resolving 
any of the crisis in public education, the basic issues have only been deeply exacerbated during the pandemic. The underfunding, the understaffing, the uh, push for charter schools and school vouchers, the, the real effort by the Democrats and Republicans to dismantle public education and with the support of the trade unions. And so we're fighting really to build independent rank and file uh, safety committees that are able to enforce and demand these public, basic public health measures necessary to eliminate the pandemic transmission. I'll kind of conclude here with, uh, I wonder how many people on the call know that roughly 250,000 Sri Lankan teachers are currently on strike. And they face very similar issues with the union seeking to accept a deal that you know, is uh, ridiculously low in terms of wages that nowhere meets their demands um, from a government that claims that you know they simply can't afford it and has been really forcing teachers, including in rural districts where there just is not the infrastructure for it, to do distance learning on their own dime. And so some of these basic issues we see are coming up not just in California, but across the entire globe. And it's the task of our movement, the task of socialists to raise political consciousness in the working class, to break out of the straitjacket of the trade unions and the Democratic Party, and to take up the conscious fight for socialism. So my, my final appeal, I know I've talked for quite a while now. Um, I hope you found it very interesting, but I will be deeply pleased if you vote for me. But what I really hope for, because this isn't going to be decided in this recall election, is that you take up the fight for socialism. You build a rank and file committees in your workplaces. You join the Socialist Equality Party. You build a chapter of our youth group at your uh, university or high school, the International Youth and Students for Social Equality. Uh, you work with us to carry this fight of the working class forward. Because socialism is not a set of policies that get enacted when you elect this or that politician. Socialism is the working class bringing the international economy under its democratic control. So I'll wrap up my presentation there. It went a little longer than I anticipated, uh, but I, I wanna throw it open to uh, questions and discussion. And uh, thank you very much for having me speak. And uh, Norisa, I imagine you've been watching questions roll in. Yes. No, um, thank you very much, David. Uh, that was an extremely um, uh, extensive uh, and helpful uh, report. I think that um, it's totally clear uh, from what you've laid out that the uh, the fight uh, being put forward and the perspective of the Socialist Equality Party, um, your campaign and, and the campaign that we're running uh, is really based uh, on the highest level um, of science um, and really putting forward uh, a, a perspective and a fight to ensure that not a single uh, more a child uh, or adult um, contracts uh, this this virus. Um, I, I also just want to point out, you know, um, you had mentioned that, you know, on August 16th, Newsom, uh, it was in one of your slides, you know, issued an executive order to the hospitals um, that the ICUs uh, and the, um, you know, the hospitals were going to uh, have an immense surge, you know, um, this whole time we've been, you know, the line by the Democratic Party by Newsom has been, oh, well, at least we don't look like Florida. At least we don't look like Texas. Um, we have, uh, you know, higher vaccination rates, et cetera. Um, but I think that it really points to the fact that the Democratic Party, um, you know, just as much as the Republicans, you know, has uh, is enacting a policy of really letting the virus rip through society. Uh, this was, uh, you know, actually um, 
it was uh, Thomas Friedman, a columnist for, with the New York Times, who wrote last May, May, May um, sorry, the May before last, May 2020, uh, that we can't, uh, you know, let the, um, uh, we cannot let the cure be worse than the disease. And that was really the line that was taken up by the Trump administration um, for a policy of reopening. Uh, there was not going to be any more lockdowns. Um, the the mitigation efforts, uh, you know, were uh, you know half haphazard, insufficient, um, and in many places completely out the window. Um, so just you know to kind of uh, start off. Um, you know, the discussion with, you know, the, the situation facing the hospitals, uh, which is really dire. Um, we've received a, a question uh, from a nurse. Um, Elizabeth asks, um, uh, if, if elected, um, what would you do to uh, solve um, the, the understaffing um, in, in hospitals, what do you think about um, the fact that hospitals are unprepared uh, for catastrophes uh, and emergencies? Um, uh, what do you think uh, needs to be needs to be done? Right. So, I think one thing that's very important to note is that the crisis in healthcare began long before the pandemic. I've actually written uh, several articles over the years on various strikes occurring, uh, particularly near where I live in Northern California. But you see a real sharp shift in uh, and decline in healthcare and the working conditions for healthcare staff, uh, I think really following the Affordable Care Act in 2008. Now, in California, we have the several enormous insurers, particularly Kaiser Permanente, um, which is the one I'm most familiar with. It. But it's very striking. After the Affordable Care Act was passed, when everyone had to get their health insurance, uh, their enrollee numbers skyrocketed. And they very consciously maintained their nursing and staff levels at the previous level. So they were pulling in all this money uh, from new enrollees in their healthcare program and essentially leaving them completely unserved in term, uh, a, a lot of their members unserved in terms of basic and essential issues, including mental health. Uh, I mean, I don't wanna go into too many anecdotes, but uh, you know, I know a lot of teachers and it's a very high stressful job environment and theoretically our healthcare coverage included uh, uh, therapy and mental uh, and se therapy sessions to talk about this intense stress of dealing with the social crisis. And, and the basic line of Kaiser, they wouldn't come out and say it, but essentially, uh, if you weren't suicidal, you weren't actually going to see a therapist. And this is a very common thing that uh, I've heard from many different people who have sought mental health care uh, within their uh, Kaiser insurance program. And the situation is not really different for any of the other insurers. So across the entire state, you've had growing enrollment in insurance, you've had staffing at hospitals that either maintained or declined, and particularly with the pandemic. And this is one of the points I was trying to make with the, um, let me see if I can bring it back up, the hospital, the ICU capacity within the California, which a lot of hospitals, because they uh, were losing money from canceling and delaying elective surgeries, actually decreased their staffing ratios and capacities during the pandemic. Uh, the precise opposite of what needed to happen and would have happened under a planned healthcare system uh, did not. And so, uh, again, if you look at this chart on the right, the available ICU beds, even when the pandemic surge from December and January declines going into May, June, you don't see the heights of ICU capacity 
rising again to where they were in 2020. Uh, this is part of that structural decline in healthcare capacity during the pandemic. So you're asking what the alternative is. And the heart of it is we have to take healthcare out of private hands, out of private profit. Uh, it's, I, I'm particularly struck. There's uh, a, a big, I mean, we've seen a big call in the middle class radicals and the pseudo left for what they're calling for single payer healthcare or Medicare for all, or in California, they're saying Medi-Cal for all. And they're so thoroughly missing the point, which is what's actually necessary. As long as we subordinate the provision of basic social rights like healthcare to private profits, whether that's uh, through single payer health insurance, whether that's uh, through Medicare, um, as long as we keep the healthcare industry in the hands of private hospitals in the hands of private insurance companies, uh, we will be unable to rationally respond uh, to things like the pandemic, to uh, will be unable to reverse these deeper structural underfunding and understaffing that's really accelerated since 2008. Um, so what we need to do is very similar to what we need to do with the utility companies. Uh, we need to turn the major corporations into actual public utilities that are operated not for the profits of investors or a handful of CEOs, but are organized and run for the benefit of society. Healthcare is particularly stark. There is not a middle way. I mean, the United States is a country that has uh, one of the highest, in terms of developed countries, has one of the highest healthcare costs yet on metric after metric is consistently below other developed countries uh, in terms of uh, maternal mortality uh, and child delivery. Uh, well, I mean, metric after metric, healthcare in the United States is provided at a terrible level, deeply exploitative level, uh, deeply unsustainable level if you follow Twitter of doctors and nurses under the current pandemic circumstances. Uh, they are really burning out because of the getting PTSD, getting, you cannot see people die day after day and have it not affect you. And when I, when I see, you know, this call for like, I, I think all those people talking about Medicare for all or Medi-Cal for all are going to be genuinely surprised at how much further to the left ordinary workers are than they are. Uh, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a worker who is not willing to call for completely socialized medicine. Yeah, no, thank you, David. Um, if I could actually jump in there too. I mean, there's what, you know, what you've laid out, um, you know, there is an immense amount of anger towards uh, the Democratic Party, towards Newsom. You know, if you threw out the uh, ratios uh, for for nurses, uh, as we know, this is tied uh, directly to, um, you know, patient lives uh, and, and staffing, et cetera, um, you know, uh, proceeded with reopen school reopenings, as you've laid out. Um, but your campaign is calling for a no vote uh, in uh, the recall uh, and a vote for you. Um, could you, you know, explain sort of what, who are the forces behind this, um, behind this recall, um, and you know, what are their connections to events uh, like the the January 6 coup? Um, attempt, uh, et cetera. Could you kind of uh, address that? Because I think there's a bit of, of confusion, um, you know, when there's a lot of, uh, you know, people who are com coming and saying, you know, we want to support you, but what do we, you know, what do we vote? We hate Newsom, et cetera. Uh, so could you explain that? Definitely. Um, and I mean, certainly uh, there have been people who've heard me talk like I've just talked in this presentation and say, boy, you really hate Newsom. Why on earth are you calling 
uh, for a no vote on the recall if you because clearly he he and the Democratic Party have done a disastrous and I would dare say criminally uh, homicidal uh, job with regards to the pandemic and but you raise the important point the very far right forces that were engaged in this recall campaign and none of the issues that we criticize Gavin Newsom for, none of the class issues, are even slightly resolved by a Larry Elder presidency, or sorry, a governorship, are not at all resolved by a Kevin Pafra a governorship. As I've mentioned, aside from our campaign, uh, I am unaware of a single one that's actually calling for the elimination of SARS-CoV-2, uh, the eradication of this pandemic and disease. So we have to soberly look at the forces involved. Uh, a lot of, and this recall election, the petition that went through was the fifth of seven recall attempts by uh, far right uh, fascist forces supporting the Trump conspiracy theory that the uh, 2020 election was stolen. Some of them are so far distanced from reality. I've actually uh, been invited as a recall candidate to speak on a panel where one of the moderators claims uh, that Trump won California in the 2020 elections, which is so incredibly distanced from reality. Uh, obviously, I said to hell with that. But the recall campaign was organized with the intention of mobilizing and bringing to the fore anti-vaxxer, uh, fascistic militia types, and to really make that the driving force in state politics. And the only reason they got the millions of signatures they did was precisely because there was a growing and widespread opposition to nuisance policies. Now, through the course of this campaign, we've been able to reach a lot of workers. We've been able to reach a lot of students and a lot of people who are deeply hostile to the Democrats' policies. Uh, but as you'll see in the polls, we have not been able to reach a majority. Uh, we, everyone who hears about us finds it very interesting. It's very interesting in the campaign. But we have a certain political responsibility which is we are not going to uh, bring down this government uh, without actually preparing the working class to replace it. And if we just uh, pull the pin on the recall grenade and say, let the chips fall where they may, and maybe we'll get a governor uh, that is 100% anti-abortion, that is uh, going to remove even the most basic health measures in the pandemic, that's uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face. Our policy is to organize the working class regardless of the outcome of this election, whether Newsom remains, whether Larry Elder is put in place with the mere 15 or 20 percent of the vote, whether I win, the question of the coming period isn't going to be decided by the governor, but it's going to be decided by the extent to which the working class is organized to fight in relation to the pandemic. And so that's how we're oriented. And we will not form a united front with fascists to bring down the Newsom government. Uh, we draw a very sharp line in the sand on that. And we 100% disagree with people who are saying, uh, we'll work with anyone to take down Newsom. Because uh, we won't. The Socialist Equality Party will not. We have more responsibilities than that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, and I, I also, too, um, want to note that you took up this question as well um, in a, a recent uh, uh, interview uh, with um, the Bad Faith podcast. Um, everyone who uh, is listening in today, who's joining us, uh, I do encourage you to head to socialism2021.org. 
Um, there you can find links to David's recent interviews, podcasts, including um, uh, this most recent one, uh, as well as uh, our statements, um, statements from David uh, on everything from uh, the, the horrific uh, wildfire situation, climate change, uh, to our uh, campaign to uh, close schools uh, and and non-essential businesses and and, re and and really eradicate uh, this virus. Um, if you agree with what you've heard so far, um, if you um, support uh, David, please go uh, make a donation to support this campaign uh, that really represents the interests of of the the masses um, of the working class and young people uh, throughout California who and beyond um, this is an international campaign as David said nothing can be sort of resolved on a state by state or national basis um, and I just you know um, also want to point out uh, you know David uh, also throughout your you know your presentation you really showed uh, the extreme you know the the wealth of of the um billionaires um uh, the uh, immense um uh, increases uh, in in their personal wealth and for the um the, the stock and portfolios of the major corporations um i wanted to point out that uh you know in the last 2 weeks um uh, Facebook and, and Mark Zuckerberg, as well as uh, Chevron Oil, uh, these major corporations whose executives were going to begin going into the office themselves starting in September, have announced that they're postponing their return uh, to in-person, uh, you know, to work. And uh, Zuckerberg released um, for uh, Facebook uh, executives, a, 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 a system to use avatars so they can actually meet in virtual conference rooms as their avatar selves, and which you know is essentially a, a glaring admission of, of really how dangerous um, uh, the situation is. But for the working class. And for the children um, you know, of the working class uh, and uh, you know, students in, in colleges, universities, everything is being uh, thrown open. Um, and actually, we have you know, on this, this sort of uh, question regarding um, you know, the, the, these mitigation efforts that have been insufficient um, and the difference between our call for eradication, um, there is another question um from uh joshua asks uh he says a healthy sentiment against lockdowns is the fact that suicides alcohol substance abuse depression and self-harm has been on the rise due to lockdowns how would the scp ensure that the mental health of students and families remain healthy during a lockdown. Um, I have a point to say on this, but I'll, if you want to uh, go first too, David. Sure. So I think there's a couple of very important points on this. Uh, the first is that, and this is so true of so many of the problems within the pandemic itself, the very tragic reality is that life expectancy in the United States was already declining before the pandemic precisely because of an increase in deaths of despair. So we're talking about increased liver disease, increased alcoholism, increased drug overdoses, increased suicides. And this flows, I mean, this isn't necessarily the best graph to present it, but it does speak to the issue. The immense and growing inequality within the United States, uh, the fact that so many people have been seeing a decline in living standards have felt themselves uh, squeezed in terms of rent, in terms of housing in general, food, in terms of unemployment. And you, uh, so you had this decline in life expectancy occurring even before uh, a, a deadly disease was unleashed on the world. And so 
the increased deaths of despair during the pandemic, during the lockdowns in the pandemic, have multiple sources. One is certainly the relative social isolation many people feel. Uh, I'm sure we have all felt it over the past year. Boy, I wish I could spend more time with family. Boy, I wish I could spend more time with my friends. Uh, there's so many people uh, that you miss seeing, so many things you miss doing uh, because of this uh, situation of the pandemic. Um, but it's also compounded by the 650,000 people who have died in this country from the pandemic itself. Those are all relatives. Those are all friends and family of someone. And it's compounded by the increasing economic despair uh, coming out of the pandemic. So the response of the socialist equality, the response of the working class, uh, we, you, we can't just focus in as a few of these figures do. I'm thinking in particular of uh, Glenn Greenwald, this uh, increasingly clownish figure, who focuses in on, okay, what are the specific mental health impacts of uh, lockdown measures and therefore we shouldn't lock down because the real answer is the way to retur return to normal or really we need to return to far better than normal as i said life expectancy was already declining before the pandemic but we need to eliminate transmission and the harder we fight to eliminate transmission the fewer people die the harder we fight to eliminate transmission, the shorter the lockdowns will be. Uh, I, I think like many people across this country, I'm currently in a very difficult decision. I've not really seen my parents for over a year. And I'm confronted with the terrifying decision. Uh, uh, if I go visit them, will I bring the Delta variant and kill them? Uh, a somewhat more striking and unusual example, uh, I've got a newborn daughter and I have not even met my wife's parents. They certainly have not met their grandchild. And there's a very similar uh, calculus afoot. Uh, how can we safely visit? And you know, even when you look at their vaccination, when you get these leaky vaccines and you get an elderly populace, uh, the fundamental issues of social isolation and uh, cannot be solved while we allow the pandemic to spread indefinitely. So in order to make the lockdowns necessary to eliminate the pandemic effective, in order to make them, in order to minimize the mental health aspects of it, we need to have a mass transfer of wealth from these billionaires, from the capitalist class to the working class. We need to actually fund healthcare so people can get, uh, I mean, you've already seen the slides I had uh, uh, dealing with the, let me see if I can bring it back up, the psychiatric illnesses, mood disorders, and anxiety disorders that flow out of COVID-19 uh, infections. Uh, and I've already mentioned the great difficulty a lot of teachers have had uh, in actually accessing mental health services through their insurance. We need to fund a massive increase in uh, mental health services, in healthcare in general. We need to make workers whole so that if they have to stay out of work for one or two months, we need to pay their wages. We need to make small businesses whole uh, uh, in order to actually prevent the, you know, these bankruptcies. So there's an immense amount that needs to be done for an effective lockdown to occur. And the main hurdle you constantly run up against is capitalism. We can't afford these things if we're also paying hundreds of billions of dollars to Musk, Ellison, and Bezos. Uh, you know, if our approach to society is we're going to carefully weigh Jeff Bezos' desire to fly into space with an Amazon worker's desire to not get infected on the job, uh, I mean, that's the current cost-benefit analysis they're talking about. And we have to say that there is no weighing between these two things. To hell with Bezos and his space project. We need safe work environments. 
and that will mean lockdowns to eliminate transmission combined with public health measures and combined with direct financial support to workers, families, and small businesses. That's the only way to deal with this because the alternative, allowing COVID-19 to become endemic is going to result in a long-term mental health crisis. We already have a lack of access to mental health care throughout so much of the United States for so much of the population. And if you get these increasing rates of psychiatric illnesses, of mood disorders, of anxiety disorders, if you get people dealing with the intense personal loss of parents and grandparents and friends and family uh, that will occur if we simply let her, let her rip and have, you know, say children are just going to get infected. Um, that far from saving lives in terms of protecting mental health, it's going to create an ever growing catastrophe, I think particularly among children and youth. Uh, so that would be my basic answer. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, I mean, I would also add um, that, you know, there's uh, no one that wants this uh, pandemic over uh, more than uh, we do. I mean, the, the death toll, uh, which continues to skyrocket, the filling up of the pediatric ICUs, I mean, this, it, it can only be described as a crime against humanity. Um, and I think the point that you made in your presentation that, you know, there was um, a conscious decision made by the ruling class, by both parties, um, to let the virus rip meant, you know, the difference between, uh, you know, um, uh, really um, uh, forceful public health measures that could have, uh, you know, kept the death toll in the thousands versus, um, you know, the projection of, of, you know, 15 million um, that, you know, that you mentioned, um, it, you know, and, and along these lines too, um, you know, I just want to respond to uh, this question that was brought up, you know, is there, uh, you know, the, kind of the sentiment towards lockdowns. I mean, these were they were never carried out on a full um, basis. Um, and with regards to sort of mental health, you know, um, I think it's important too to note and refer to the slide that that David showed, showing that you know the decline um, in uh, the percentage of wealth that has been uh, going to. Um, you know, the bottom 50% uh, of society and the increasing wealth that has been going to the top, you know, 1%, uh, the top 10% of society um, has been increasing. So this has been, you know, also bound up with, you know, under under the Reagan administration, their, um, uh, his administration pursued, uh, you know, a huge uh, cuts to social services, mass uh, closures of mental health facilities. We've seen with that the, um, you know, uh, really the, you know, uh, in, imprisonment of large, uh, you know, uh, numbers of, uh, you know, mentally ill um, amongst particularly the poorest populations. Um, but, you know, I just want to emphasize that the ruling class has created you know, the fatigue where it exists. They've created, um, they, you know, they have dragged this horrific pandemic on for, you know, over a year and a half and are telling us now that we have to live with this, that we have to live with our pediatric ICUs full. And we say that we refuse that, you know, absolutely not. Um, this is, you know, and it's, be and it's because those policies are, are, the policies of a ruling class that is determining this, it does not reflect the interests of the masses of the working class like this campaign does um, and, and the support for, um, for, for David Moore. Um, 
and so you know I, I think that those things uh, you know are really important to bring we you know we want to pursue a policy of eradication to to end this pandemic in a matter of months because we refuse uh, to continue uh, living and rather dying uh, like this so um, uh, I, I'd also like to bring up um, another um, kind of a question about the um, uh, the DSA um, and you know as um, you know you've uh, mentioned uh, you know uh, they are not the DSA is not running a candidate uh, you know, Sanders has openly endorsed uh, Newsom. Uh, we have uh, Ocasio-Cortez, you know, handing out uh, backpacks uh, and pushing, uh, you know, facilitating with the, the reopening of schools. Um, I was wondering if you could, you know, speak more to this question on, you know, why, uh, you know, what the DSA is, um, why they're not uh, running a candidate and, you know, why is it, um, what are the, the interests behind, you know, pushing, pushing these reopenings? Sure, I can speak on that a bit. Of course, the DSA is the Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, I mean, there's a long history to that organization, a long anti-communist history to that organization. Um, but in terms of this election, I mean, obviously, their entire orientation for the preceding period, and really from their inception, has been their task is to convince the Democratic Party to move slightly to the left. That's been their task since the 70s, and far from succeeding, the Democratic Party has moved farther and farther and farther to the right over those decades. Uh, now, with one could say a greater influence than ever for the Democratic Socialists of America within the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is more right-wing than it has ever been in its entire history. Um, and well, I'm trying to think very carefully on that because obviously the Democratic Party has been the party of slavery and the Ku Klux Klan. So there's stiff competition for most right-wing at time period for the Democratic Party. Uh, but, the, but the heart of the point remains, which is uh, precisely as the DSA has been integrated into the Democratic Party apparatus, uh, the Democratic Party has been pursuing relentless wars abroad, relentless budget cuts within uh, the United States as a whole. And so in this context, we have, as I've mentioned, the incredible political crisis in California. Polls for the recall are all over the place. Some of them put Gavin Newsom comfortably uh, uh, retaining his position. Some of them have the recall succeeding. In terms of the recall candidates, uh, you know, none of them are looking to get a majority of the votes. Uh, it, it's an incredibly volatile situation where there's clearly large widespread anger against Newsom and an increasing break with the Democratic Party. Uh, but it's finding very confused expression. So under those circumstances, the DSA's decision uh, at the national level, I mean, I didn't check yesterday, but uh, as of very recently, there's been no articles written, no statements issued at the national level or in their affiliated magazine, Jacobin. Um, and so the only statements have kind of come out at this local level and it's very striking, the complacency and I'd say real middle-class character of the DSA's uh, response to this recall election, where they've entirely adopted Gavin Newsom's uh, demands. Newsom says, vote no on the recall and just leave question two blank. It really doesn't matter. In my personal experience, when I announced my own candidacy as a socialist opponent, uh, a member of the DSA, true to form, we've written articles on this in the past, uh, immediately decided it would be a good time to threaten to kill me with an ice pick and say, boy, you'd love to pick my brain. And it, that same DSA member went on to declare, 
you'd be better off voting for Larry Elder than for David Moore because he's so anti-working class. Uh, you know, this is talking about a rather insane libertarian Larry Elder, uh, who's opposed to the very existence of a minimum wage. Uh, but that, there was such a deep class hostility to a worker running for governor and presenting an alternative to the Democratic Party. Uh, contrary to the official position of the DSA leadership, a lot of ordinary members in the DSA didn't join it because it's an anti-communist organization. Whatever confusion they have, they're looking for a way to fight for socialism. And so a lot of ordinary members of the DSA have uh, stood up for me on social media, on Twitter, have declared that people should vote for me, are opposed to the orientation to Gavin Newsom being pushed by the DSA as a whole. Uh, but I want to actually bring up some of the explicit things they've said. Um, you know, let me see if I can get their statement. But they, the DSA LA statement is very significant, they claim that the path to Medicare for all goes through California and relies upon Governor Newsom asking President Biden for waivers from the Affordable Care Act so that California can start running its own health care system and then all of a sudden we'll be able to get Medi-Cal for all. And I mean, obviously that's a very tortured chain of custody for quote unquote progressive politics. Um, so, but the, the heart of it, and you'll really notice it there, they see no possibility for the independent activity of the working class. The only thing socialists, the only thing workers can do is beg one right-wing Democrat to beg another right-wing Democrat to allow the state to have its own healthcare system. No mention of the pandemic, no mention of the complete insufficiency of Medi-Cal for all in relation to actually uh, uh, dealing with this immense healthcare catastrophe. No mention of widespread opposition to the Newsom administration. And by refusing to endorse, by refusing to call for a vote for a socialist candidate like myself in this election, uh, by endorsing Gavin Newsom's call for a blank vote on the second, uh, question. They're essentially saying that all opposition, all distrust uh, of Gavin Newsom has to flow through the far right. They will not raise it. They will not support anyone who opposes Gavin Newsom from the left. Uh, you know, they won't, obviously they aren't going to oppose Gavin Newsom from the left. They won't support anyone opposing Gavin Newsom from the left. In their opinion, all progress flows through the Demo this far-right Democratic Party. And if I may very briefly bring in the examples that we're seeing again and again uh, across Europe, you have social democratic parties, the SPD in Germany, the Socialist Party in France, uh, PASOK in Greece, that are moving farther and farther to the right. The Labour Party in Britain moving very far to the right. And, you know, enacting budget cuts, uh, throwing open the economies, attacking Im uh, during the pandemic, viciously attacking immigrants. And there's a variety of pseudo left figures and groups along the lines of the DSA in each of these countries that says, whatever you do, you can't break with the Labour Party. Whatever you do, you can't break with the SPD. Whatever you do, you can't break with the Socialist Party in France. And the result of that has been the immense growth of the National Front in France, the alternative for Deutschland in Germany. Uh, uh, I mean, the grotesquerie of Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom um, and the replacement of Corbyn by Keir Starmer and the Labour Party. Uh, the result of the refusal, the absolute refusal to present a left-wing alternative to the right-wing social democracy has been the growth of the far right, not because the German people or the French people are racist anti-immigrants, but because they're looking for some alternative. And it is the duty, the absolute duty of socialists to provide an organized political alternative to the right-wing policies of the government. Um, I'm trying to think, 
I mean, there's more points that can be made along those lines, but that really is the heart of it. The working class needs independent politics. And if, if you go along with the pseudo left and say that the only task for the working class is to play mother may I with the most right wing politicians to have power in generations, uh, you're, all that that does is it makes the working class think they're disgusted with socialism. When you tell them that socialism is voting for Hillary Clinton and Joseph Biden, the working class says, well, to hell with that. Um, and so what we're actually finding when we go out and we're talking to educators, nurses, auto workers, you know, at Volkswagen or Dana, uh, there's an immense interest in a socialism that is fighting for the working class and that says to hell with the Democrats and Republicans. Um, but that, that's why we're in this current election campaign to provide that conscious political alternative and raise that understanding of the complete dead end that is the Democratic Party. Thanks, David. Yeah, I, um, I think you what you're describing is you know the the shift to uh, the left um, uh, towards uh, socialism by the working class by the by the masses throughout the world it's an, an international uh, phenomenon um, but at the same time a, a movement to um, to the right um, by all of the the various um, uh, parties uh, levers within the ruling class and that includes uh, not not just the Republicans, but also the Democrats, the who are two sides of the same coin. Um, on this question, I'd I'd like us to you know turn to uh, you know discuss more the the question of the growth of the class struggle, and you know the the fact that the working class is looking for an independent political perspective. Um, you had mentioned in your presentation um, uh, the uh, strike uh, by by um, by Volvo auto workers, uh, the rejection of the um, contract by Dana um, uh, auto parts workers, um, and you had also mentioned uh, recently that you attributed the lockdown itself. Um, initial lockdown last year to the working class. Um, so um, I'd like to, you know, like us to discuss um, what that means um, and also in the framework of a question that, that we just got from um, a, a supporter, Steve. Uh, Steve asks you, um, if you could speak to the importance of the eradication strategy as a political question for the working class. Um, he asks, you know, essentially, um, what do you, would you say to, to workers, teachers, and parents who are opposed to the conditions in schools uh, yet feel a, a sense of um, a fatigue or, or skepticism um, as to as to how to go about it, uh, what the strategy and and the fight and the way forward is. Sure, the heart of any revolutionary activity is to first tell the truth, and there is so much information, misinformation going out around the pandemic and really being pushed by all the politicians and all the media figures. And you get completely new workers, parents, teachers, stepping to the forefront. Um, for example, there was uh, this uh, British parent who spoke at our Sunday uh, meeting on the pandemic, just describing very forcefully the conditions confronting uh, parents in Britain where the official government policy is essentially we want children to get infected as fast as possible. Now, the main hurdle so many teachers are confronting is the 
fabricated unanimity amongst the media figures and politicians to essentially claim that eradication, elimination is impossible and we just have to live with it. And they try to claim that anyone worried about this pandemic is uh, neurotic, is too anxious, is just uh, uh, unable to do a basic cost benefit analysis. You have Biden telling this young girl on national television, don't worry, you aren't going to get sick, you aren't going to spread it to your parents. Uh, it's very, it's, it's not dangerous for kids. And, you know, I've already shown you the graphs on pediatric hospitalizations. So, the rank and file strategy, the trade unions in the United States and internationally are deeply tied in with the capitalist politicians. In the educators, it's so very, very stark. Randy Weingarten, the head of the American Federation of Teachers, is on the Democratic National Committee. She makes $400,000, $500,000 a year. Uh, her life is completely different from the life of any teacher. Uh, her life is that of a Washington, D.C. jet setter, uh, you know, partying with Obama and Martha's Vineyard. So her attitude is we have to keep the stock market high. And everything about teaching is subordinated to that. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, one extreme example that you look at the United Auto Workers, which has been engaged in a years long criminal conspiracy against its own membership, where it's almost its entire leadership have been convicted of taking bribes to uh, uh, sell out their membership during contract negotiations. Millions of dollars were funneled into them for this purpose. And even at the very local level, the union fights to demobilize the working class. I can speak very sharply of the experience in Oakland where the Oakland Education Association leadership uh, teachers were deeply hostile to a reopening of the schools during the pandemic at Gavin Newsom's demand last year. And the union said, look, we have no choice. If we don't endorse uh, this rotten tentative agreement, then the district can enforce the tentative agreement on us. And the, the leadership literally said, we will not negotiate anything better for you. And so under those circumstances, the teachers felt isolated. They felt like there was nothing they could do to help out uh, to defend their students. And so the tentative agreement squeaked by by a narrow margin uh, due to the active work of the union to try and enforce it on the members. Now, we were ultimately saved last year by the mass abstention of parents. Parents didn't want to send their kids back to school. They kept them home. And so you'd get classes that were supposed to be full, 20, 30 students, instead of having two. And we're running into a similar situation now. Across the state, the official stance of the state government is there should not be distance learning. There's independent study, which is basically homeschooling with very minimal uh, teacher support. Uh, but there are the the actual bill got passed in the assembly in the state that distance learning should not be an option. And so we're finding teachers and parents feeling like they're forced into this situation that's increasingly unsafe. And it's a farce from beginning to end because as outbreaks occur in schools, children are sent back for quarantine, teachers are sent out for quarantine, and you've got this pretense, this imagination, we're going to have in-person instruction like before the pandemic. And it's a complete farce where you get no continuous instruction. And instead of having a distance learning framework where everyone gets access to basic education, you get kids who are shipped out of school uh, for weeks at a time, uh, having to quarantine. You get teacher, you know, a rotation of teachers and substitutes. Uh, I believe we wrote on one district in the Bay Area where the entire fourth and fifth grade classes were under quarantine at the same time. And so out of all of this ridiculousness, the main tool 
that the state and federal government has used to carry this out is the feeling of hopelessness and isolation among workers, teachers, and parents. And we need to break through that. And that's our task. And that's why I began my answer with the first task of a revolutionary is to speak the truth. We do not begin with what we believe the Democrats are willing to give us. We begin with what is necessary for our students, what is necessary for society. And that is what we fight for. And quite naturally, because they represent a deeply hostile class force, the Democrats and Republicans are not going to be willing to give that to us. And so we need to organize parents and teachers for an independent fight and school staff. I mean, the situation confronting janitors and school nurses is also deeply horrifying. Um, so the rank and file strategy is to take all these local struggles that are erupting because of the crisis in this or that school, in this or that district, in this or that workplace, and imbue them, suffuse them with a political understanding of the broader economic and political crisis that all of these local struggles are not actually local struggles, but local incidents of a global class struggle. And with that understanding, we can build towards an actual statewide, nationwide strike to force the closure of schools, to force the full funding of education and healthcare, and uh, to force the question of socialism versus capitalism. Are we going to weigh the well-being and health care of children versus Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos' desire to fly into space? Or are we going to take a firm stand and say we will eliminate this pandemic and the right to life and liberty far outweighs anyone's right to be a multi-billionaire? Um, anyways, that would be my answer. <laughs> well, no, that's, I completely agree. Um, and, you know, if we have um, a lot of people on the call, um, we weren't able to get to all the questions, uh, but we will be having, David will be having another uh, town hall meeting one week from today at the same time, 2 p.m. Pacific. Um, so uh, we encourage you to uh, share the information about this meeting. Uh, it's on socialism2021.org um, and to you know get involved with this campaign you can um, contact us uh, on the world socialist website wsws.org um, fill out the contact us um, and i also really want to appeal to everyone to make a donation to support this campaign um, the program that david has laid out uh, really, uh, you know, reflects the the interests, um, the the aspirations, the uh, the health and 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 uh, livelihood of of masses of of uh, workers, of immigrants, of young people, um, and it's in stark contrast uh, to the program and policies carried out by both the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, from Newsom to DeSantis, we're putting forward an independent uh, political perspective in the fight uh, for socialism. So we really encourage you to um, donate to the campaign, get involved with the campaign, read David's statements, share them with your coworkers, uh, your friends. I know there's a number of teachers and nurses on the call. Um, and we really um, want to thank you for, uh, you know, listening and joining, um, joining with us today. And um, we uh, hope to see you uh, in uh, our other campaign um, town halls and really want you to get involved. So thank you very much. And thank you thank so you. much, David. Thank, thank you, Narisa. Thank you all for attending. If we didn't get to your question today, feel free to write that in, send it to us and we'll try to get to it next time. Uh, but it was fantastic speaking with you all.